Good evening, everybody. Looks like we're up to chapter seven of our favorite book, Therapy of Desire, uh, by words, not arms. We're still talking about Lucretius, this time on the topic of anger and aggression. Rightio. Um, have you had enough of Lucretius yet? Yep, <laughs> I reckon I have. <laughs> I'm still enjoying it. I, yeah. It's I must great. say, because it was a bad, I, I did get angry a couple of times this week and I probably because I was just more aware of anger and I just thought a couple of times, oh, anger. <laughs> <laughs> the topic, you know, just reading about it. All. <laughs> One thing I find reading this spam is, um, and maybe this is just my reading style in general, that I can't help but kind of... Um, I'm not a critical reader. I read and I kind of go along with whatever the, the writer's talking about generally and, and, and feel very generous towards my uh, allowance of what they're saying. So, so I kind of got a feeling throughout that um, Nussbaum wasn't really um, that happy with, the, well, particularly Epicurus's version of philosophy she seemed to be think, saying that Lucretius was um, um, making a more a kind of uh, an attempt to to bring friendship and communal life and marriage and stuff into the into the picture more was sort of my takeaway. So I often felt like um, that, uh, and I, I wasn't sure if it was me or Nussbaum, where I was kind of. Um, not really that satisfied with with some parts of the argument. The obvious tensions that, especially the immortality stuff, that she seemed to be sighing and like, oh, not more immortality kind of stuff. You know, did you guys feel like that at all? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a tension between the the godlike life and the the human, the frail life of the human. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I did. I think what struck me, particularly with this chapter, is because she's covering so much ground, and and there is so much in Lucretius. I think inevitably she is cherry picking a bit because I did go back to the text, the Lucretius text, uh, and check one or two things, and and came came away with, oh, actually, I, I'm not sure that Lucretius was emphasising what Nussbaum's emphasising. So yeah, I think there is a, it, it, it is a partial reading, I think, for um and, and I guess it has to be because she's again, she's got so much ground to cover. So that's something to bear in mind, I guess. Yeah. And again, partial reading with a strong focus on um these kind of psychological elements um that often resemble the kind of um, you know, because we're talking about the medical analogy, the kind of psychic surgery that we find later on in, in psychotherapy and things like that. So this interest in the relationship between erotic love and, and aggression, you know, these sort of typical tropes. So, yeah, if you're looking for those sorts of things, I guess it's a very specific type of reading. But also I notice, and I'm not someone who has the eye of a classicist obviously but she's in the footnotes often responding to other authors who've made comments about particular um, interpretations and, and the like right all right well we'll jump into one <clears throat> i can uh kind of jump straight in if you like the we're given a section of the poem um Oh, no, it's a different poem. Wallace Stevens' Anatomy of Monotony. I thought it was a really pretty poem, but I'm glad she kind of um, gives us an idea what it would be about. I'm not much of an um, interpreter of poetry, so I would have been like, oh, that's pretty. <laughs> Do you guys have anything to say about the poem? Because I wouldn't have been able to say much about it. Yeah, I struggled with it a bit, I do admit. Mm. Yeah, I kind of thought, as, oh, yeah, it's pretty. <laughs> and But again, it's just, it's kind of stuck there a bit without any um, linking in. So, uh, it, yeah, I think a footnote there would have been good. <laughs> yeah. Maybe she was just having a, um, a poetry day. She found that and she liked it and she thought, I wonder if I can squeeze that in somewhere. But anyway, 
So part one, anger is a less overtly central theme in Lucretius's poem than our fear and love, she says, but no book of the poem, no extended discussion is devoted to the diagnosis of the passions that prompt aggressive behavior or to their therapy. And yet scenes of brutal aggression fill the work, drawing the reader's attention repeatedly and obsessively to the pervasiveness of violence in human life. Um, she talks a, a bit about that too. Throughout the poem's aggressions, damages assail the reader's sensibilities in language more graphically physical than any devoted to the description of fear or grief. Everything naked and unarmed, quote, she quotes, yielded easily to everything that is armed. And the poem is obsessed with scenes of ripping, gouging, tearing, scenes in which what is soft and without protection yields to the intrusions of the tough and hard. If a central function of Epicurean therapeutic argument is to portray the soul's diseases in vivid, frightening language, there is no disease to which more attention is given. The human body is presented to the reader as a soft, unarmed thing, defenseless in the world of nature, subject to violence of many kinds, and the human soul being not an immutable bodiless substance, but a soft and divisible physical object can itself be ripped and lives unsafely. At the same time, however, the human being is a most dangerous being, um, more violent than any tough wild beast, a being who can create nightmarish horrors of destruction. And straight away, you know, I was really struck at some of the language, not having read it before. Um, it was, I I was almost like, hang on a second, what am I reading? You know, some of the, the examples she gives about the people being devoured by wild animals and stuff like that. I thought I was reading Schopenhauer or something for a second. Um, above the slaughter, delicate and yet invulnerable, touched by neither gratitude nor anger, lived the Epicurean gods in a life of supreme peace. The peace of the gods rests upon their complete safety. And she says, is there then any way in which human beings can live in peace, protecting the weak without violence, giving and receiving love and pleasure without aggression, gentle in an unsafe world? And this will be the topic of Nussbaum's investigation for the ongoing chapter. So that's sort of the end of the first part. Do you guys have anything you want to add or say about any of that? No, that's, a, that's good. That sum, sums it up. What do you think about that language? Because obviously that's quite striking. Yeah, it is. Uh, but then, as I say, when I went back and looked at book five, that didn't strike me as the most, uh, as the strongest remaining impression. So, yeah, that's why I think she she has uh, read it through a particular lens and focused on those passages. But there's there's a great deal more, I would say, in the in the Lucretius than and uh, than she's uh, showing us here. So I, I would just offer that caveat. Hi, Shannon. And but the language is rather violent, isn't it? Like chariots equipped with scythes, mm -hmm. uh, scythes slice off the limbs of the enemy. Legs and arms lie warm on the ground, still trembling in their blood. One man charges eagerly, eagerly forward, unaware that his left arm is being trampled by the horses. Another presses on without his right. A third tries to rise without a leg, while the toes of his severed limb lie twitching on the ground. A head cut from the warm trunk preserves the look and gaze of life kind of recalls a scene from um braveheart or something like that really i was watching sbs last night and they had a two episodes of this thing called coliseum <laughs> and they re reconstruct the building of the coliseum and of course it's a sensationalist um uh, vehicle for lots of blood and guts and mayhem but it, show, it traces historical fights within the Colosseum and the, and the emperors that built it and all that stuff yeah so that well, yeah that's right and so it's what what Lucretius is depicting here um is it is a, a Roman battle scene but it's also the entertainment of the day mm -hmm. and obviously uh Nussbaum's angling for a reading here that she's saying um that's the kind of thing that might have gone on a kind of particular uh historical narrative but 
she's sort of trying to tell us too that uh, Lucretius is saying that perhaps it's also a metaphor for the state of the man's soul, right? Mm. You know, for human souls. Um, I mean, from your reading, because you're a bit familiar with it, did that strike you as unusual or a stretch, Judith? Um, no, I'd, I'd say that's that's fair enough. Yeah, uh, I'd say that's probably what he is doing. Um, you know, that's the microcosm, and the the macrocosm is the well, sorry, the macrocosm is the uh, the violence in the world, and the microcosm is the violence within. Yeah, I'd say that's quite quite likely to be correct. Okay, who would like to walk us through part two? I took way too many notes on part well, two. Well, I'm. I'm happy to belt through part two or Judy, would you like to do next um, after that or do you want me to do this one and we can take two. No, you go ahead, Jody. I'll okay. do it. All right. So part two. So we're on page 242 and Epicurus's account of anger uh, is found in On Anger by Philodemus because um, we don't have the direct account um, from Epicurus himself. So there's a connection between anger and beliefs about the value of external items that can be damaged by another's agency. So the, the, the connection between anger and then the false beliefs, that, or well, not even the false beliefs, but, you know, the beliefs about value of the external items. So um, like in um, Aristotle, it is associated with feelings of heat and swelling and irritation but more important is the cognitive structure. So um, anger rests upon exposure and weakness. And the person is vulnerable to reversals of fortune. Now, then I wrote, it's also linked to gratitude as its opposite. Then now we're on to page 243. So, he's bringing, so we're bringing in the idea of gratitude as the opposite um, of aggression, of anger as a counterpart in nature. So these are linked with both fear and need. And not only uh, the passion of anger, but the action of aggression must be considered. So uh, not just the feeling and the passion, but the, act, the actions as well. Anger is considered to be the wish for the suffering of the original aggressor, where Aristotle said anger is defined by belief that one has been wronged and the belief that retaliation would be a good thing. Um, so for, the first one is painful and the second one is pleasurable. So the, uh, so the idea of having been wronged is painful, but the belief that retaliation is justified is pleasurable. And the Stoics see it as a longing for a future good uh, I'll stop soon for a bit of a rehash here, but I'll just finish this bit here. I'll get to the bottom of the page. The Epicurean view is a desire for the suffering of the damager. And the connections are made on the cognitive level. Uh, Aristotle sees anger as retaliatory self-assertion. I'm over the page now. I'll just finish this bit about um, Aristotle. So Aristotle sees anger as retaliatory self-assertion. So if one fails in this, there is a sense of slavishness and a deficient sense of one's own worth. So, it, uh, so it's seen more in a positive light, it feels like to me there. Um, Epicurus agrees that the retaliatory element is, um, is as a wish that the aggressor be punished. So they have that in common. Um, it does go on then. Um, about the, the opposite idea of the Christian idea. Did you want me to just stop there for a minute? Was there anything there you wanted to review? That idea of gratitude being the opposite. Um, yeah, I found that a bit strange actually, and, and perhaps that's because I haven't thought enough about it, but, uh, well, I, I suppose to, to go back a step, um, there's so many different inter ancient interpretations of anger being crammed into these couple of pages. Mm. Um, and, and so really uh, it starts with Aristotle who has whole, a whole huge discussion about it. Um, 
And she points to the key difference between Aristotle's view that sometimes anger is justified and the right thing to feel and the Stoic view that um, it's never the right thing to, to uh, well, it's, ne it's never a good option. Um, but also, so leave, leaving aside that for one moment, they both have a, a different analysis about what it, what it amounts to in terms of a desire for retaliation. And again, that's something that could could really be could really use some analysis, I think. But then again, this isn't the, the place for it because she has so much uh, material to get across. So this whole idea about the punishment of the aggressor is well, it may be um, central to the motivation of anger, but maybe it isn't. So that seems to me something that. Uh, you know, perhaps deserves a discussion on its own, but but because he and Nussbaum's just trying to set set out all the uh, the parameters, um, it, it looks it kind of feels as though it's a bit chaotic here, and and that mm. uh, we're getting all these different views about anger thrown at us. But really, all she really is trying to uh, focus on is the Epicurean one, mm. and and where she says right at the end of the passage, you've been going through, Jody. Epicurus, as Philodemus reports him, appears to agree, analysing the retaliatory element as a wish that the aggressor be punished. Well, we're not told why she thinks that he, that's what Philodemus uh, and Epicurus are saying, but that's kind of key, right? <laughs> that's the key to, well, they're to, saying to the whole point that here. It's... So I, I do find this rather confusing and and chaotic passage. Mm. The, the the part where um, they say at the top of um, 243, the bit about it's linked to both fear and need, that's brought up again later in the chapter, um, being linked to those two ideas of fear and need. Um, but it still doesn't really define it or explain it. I guess in a sense, if we talk about anger on the one hand and gratitude on the other, they're inspired by vulnerability in some sense here because the human being is soft and, and prone to damaging or whatever. So in that sense, anger comes because he's damaged and he values himself as an item of worth. And there's a cognitive element to that. Uh, he needs to punish the one who would, who would harm the thing that he values. And then gratitude then is contrasted as being like the opposite end of that because um, instead of something being one's vulnerable and, and is deprived, in the other case, he's vulnerable and he's given something that that bolsters him up. So he's grateful for that. Does that make sense? So it's a response to vulnerability in the world. That's how I'd read it. And so... Um, Given this awareness of vulnerability, the man creature and this the human being um, <clears throat> is always prone to, um, oh yeah, he has to have um, both an aggression, but he also has to have a cognitive element which responds to to the awareness of vulnerability, and that's why he's different from an animal because the animal doesn't have an awareness of vulnerability and only acts with aggression. So that's where she fiddles around a little bit later on with the how the gods and the beasts are more similar than the human beings are with the gods because we have vulnerability and the other guys don't. Mm, so I think very good point. it's to do with those sort of um, themes mm. and that there's inner vulnerabilities, not inner, innate vulnerability um, sets us up to be inherently um destructive and vengeful and the like and um and that the only way we could probably escape this well there's two options right a philosophy that somehow embraces that and and i don't know it sounds like an impossible task from what she talks about or immortality to become like a god to overcome that sort of vulnerability that i'm getting ahead well that's the chapter done <laughs> <laughs> but yeah all right look I'll, I'll keep racing on here the, so um 244 we're down we're going down through 244 um so then you know the christian ideal of turn the other cheek is mentioned so 
Um, so anger can ex can exist as a passion, but um, does it need to be acted on? You know, no, not really. The you know the the blame for a voluntary wrong. You know, there can be blame. Um, does it need to be turned into an action of aggression or retaliation? You know, so the blame is there. Also, to wish the mill. So to wish the mill isn't actually doing carrying out an action. Um, so maybe not death or torture, but milder, subtler repercussions. So it can be a very complex and long-term type of thing as well. You know, if it, and she uses the um, example here of the love relationship on the top of 245. She starts to talk about, you know, it can get all entangled up, with, you know, in the long-term relationship of, of, uh, of, of lovers, you know. So then she brings up Nikidian, and Nikidian uh, is encouraged to consider Roman examples. And the examples that are given are military might and the daring of a good commander can be seen as a virtue. So we're getting back to that idea of, of the armed, you know, the striving for victory and the hard. And then the other ones that are brought up are hard work in agriculture, and seafaring and practical enterprises um, and all of these of a, of a kind of competitive sort. Um, she then the Christian up, thing, before you yeah. get too far ahead there, the yeah. Christian idea is really saying, um, you know, it's sort of assuming that when we say someone has to be um, punished for a wrong, that it's something fairly catastrophic. But she's sort of saying, it. well, maybe it's not that far um, off track maybe it's right because um, when we wish there to be a kind of uh, harm what do you call it a punishment done to the wrongdoer it can be a rather small thing like you know even if it's corrective in in its form so that makes sense she's saying we don't have to think of it like oh we're saying they should get their head chopped off or bashed to death no no maybe it's something like getting a fine from the police or something like that you know? yeah true yeah, so then, so these examples, um, I'm in the middle of uh, these examples on 245. Yeah, so that, so that very, very masculine types of um, pursuits here, you know, and then she uses uh, Lucius Catalina, um, who is described by Salut, Salust as a hero. Um, and he has vigor of body and mind and daring, and flex, he's, he's flexible, he's cunning. Um, but he has alleged villainy, and uh, that also makes him an attractive figure in the in the in the uh, in the story. So, was he a real guy? Sorry, is he a real guy, or is he a yeah? Was he a hero? Yeah, he so, a hero. Um, well, and this was another thing I thought. You know, that was a bit weird to drag in, but it must be in Philodemus, I suppose. Um, so, Catalan, or he's usually referred to in English as Catalan, and uh, he plotted to take over the, the Roman Republic and, the, and it was Cicero's great claim to political fame that he exposed the plot of Catiline um, and, uh, and it came to nothing. And, but Sallust was a Roman historian who wrote about the um, Catilinarian conspiracy, as it's called, and the whole story. And so um, Sallust didn't really depict him as a hero. And so that's why that seems a bit of a strange reading. And But so it must be that maybe that Philodemus, uh, yeah, I, again, I'm not quite sure what she's getting at here. Um, if unless to that even a figure such as Catiline, who was a kind of as much of a villain in Roman culture as you could get, even he in some settings could be seen as having heroic qualities. Um, you got, I think what she's trying oh, yeah. to do, is, yeah, she's trying to bring in this, um, the ideas of of aggression of the day as as seen as um, uh, as a good thing, you know, used as you know, striving for victory and hard work, you know, aligned with aggression and um, strength. Yeah, that makes sense. You power. could see this as like a, you know, the hippies of Vietnam or something. <laughs> it's sort of like. Oh, we call those soldiers heroes, but they just murdered children, right? You know, just got to be peaceful and smoke weed and be, you know, all pure love and 
and free love and joy, baby, you know, that kind of thing. But they're the philosophers in this case, is the, the hippies. Mm. So then we go to the top of 246. And um, so um, I've written aggression and military virtues of the heroes and generals seem are seen as moral, basically. They're given a moral um, view. So anger is seen as a military motive, seen as having no bad consequences. Um, then, then, there, then there's a discussion of counterexamples. So we get given four counterexamples, um, and this goes over pages 247, 248, 249. So we get a discussion here of um, the, the examples of the first one is of a slave woman subjugated to hard labour and sexual service. Uh, I'll come back to that. Two is a powerful political figure used, who's used to honour and fame but is increasingly troubled. Then we get the example of a Roman wife and mother who's denied education by her husband. And finally, number four is a parent becoming angry at a child who misbehaves. So if I go quickly back to the slave woman, um, so she's subjugated, exhausted, and she takes no action against her masters because she doesn't wish to. So she has no self-assertion or self-defence. This is at the top of 247. So she has actual no wish for punishment. She does not believe, believe in her own self-worth. So she is of got, uh, that she believes she has no great value. So that, that was a counterexample of someone that might normally get angry or be aggressive. Just on an interesting note yeah. to talk to that. <clears throat> yeah just because it's relevant at the moment. I'm listening mm. to a podcast on um, women who survive domestic violence. And it's very interesting because it's about why they don't leave, you know, and that's kind of what the, the, the idea is. And these women who survive um, will often look back on themselves and go, I can't understand why I put up with that. And then, you know, part of the, the podcast message is to say that, um, it's kind of twofold the women in in the modern situation don't see themselves as being abused uh, it doesn't occur to them they rather because this is a case of domestic love and which fits with our erotic theme they they um they see themselves as a strong woman supporting um, um you know somebody with great big problems that they can help for example but also the other narrative goes that the woman is so um damaged in a way and her safety so diminished that their rational um, capacity um, diminishes to the point that you're really just in a survival mode and in that mode you're not thinking um, in this sophisticated way so it's almost like your brain is starved if you want to use it like that kind of modern way of talking about it and when they recover, when they get out of that situation and they're properly supported and they get therapy, they often don't relate to the person they were at that point in time. It's almost like a different person. So I'm just bringing this up as a kind of uh, way of saying, well, maybe these ancient philosophers didn't really understand what it was like to be a battered wife. <laughs> you know, there's always that kind of possibility as well. But you've yeah. referred to it and, before as sorry as as a learn. It's a term you used was learnt depend learnt not learnt depend learnt helplessness helplessness. Sorry, go go on, Judy. Yes, sorry, Judy. But I think just in this first case study, though, and I, I totally um, agree with your reading, Courtney, about the uh, the domestic violence matters. But uh, in the in the first case study. Uh, it's important to recognise that the slave had literally no rights, you know. So uh, in our society, women in a domestic violence situation do have rights. They have, they, I mean, obviously there are practical impediments to them. It, even if they recognise that their situation shouldn't be going on, there are, there can be practical impediments such as, you know, threats from um, a violent spouse or whatever, but, but, but they do have the right to seek shelter seek police help and um, and seek safety, whereas in ancient Rome, a slave did not have any of those rights. So that's kind of in the picture as well. Um, and so it's it's not, you know, it's there's a psychological 
response responses, but there's also the legal situation. So even if um, so she she literally is a slavish person as described by Aristotle because she's literally a slave and therefore has no um, no rights that she could even um, prosecute even if she had the, the psychological wherewithal to do that. So in a sense, it's almost that's a case study that's almost outside the bounds of what what we can even um, well or, or what could even be. Uh, remedied under this scheme. So that's why I thought that was a bit strange. <clears throat> and, but, but yes, to, but to the extent that the woman um, may not in fact believe that her, uh, she, her, her being has value, that may well be, and that would be reinforced by the messages from the society around her that she had no rights whatsoever, excuse me. <coughs> and therefore would not feel anger, like she wouldn't Well, that's right, anger. exactly. Yeah. 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 She, um, yeah. All right, so then the second example, this is on page 247. So the powerful political figure used to honour, who's used to honour and fame, that's his normal situation. He gets increasingly troubled and insecure. Uh, like the tyrant in the Republic, he is prey to fears and anxieties. Uh, he ends up hiding away, not, not, wishing, not wishing the mill, but hates himself. Um, this depressive reaction to damages and uncertainties. Uh, so I don't. I've got that anyway. It's a depression, a depressive reaction to damages and uncertainties, and uncertainties in book three. Also in, um, uh, and it's also brought up in book three in the passage on the wild beasts at war. Um, aggression to one's own self, seen as needy, finite insecure, even wishing for his own death. Mm. Yeah. Did you want to comment on him? Well, the idea, obviously, is that um, <clears throat> he's given up on, what do you say, given up on um, trying to struggle against those who seek to hurt him. And in so doing, um, what did he say? Um, basically, he turns his aggression inwards towards himself, against himself. So that sort of depression that you're talking about is is a um, he because we wish to damage the person or harm the person, punish the person who damages the item of value, which is ourselves, and it's us who are damaging our own self. We turn our aggressive urges against ourselves, even to the point that we would kill ourselves. That's kind of an interesting way of thinking about suicide and 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 this kind of depression that you know maybe he, he saw this kind of thing happening in people who were rich and powerful and and we would say don't seem to have any excuse to want to act like that yeah it just reminds me of the letter we the Seneca letter we read on the weekend you know Seneca points out that people who seem to have it all together they've got power and they've got wealth but it's often their wealth that is causing them all these burdens that that weigh so heavily on their psyche, and I think uh, it, um, Lucretius is a great observer of this kind of thing. Hi, Carl. Hi, Carl. I'm Hi. Not hey, Carl. I'm not surprised it yeah. reminds you of that um, because I read that section <laughs> when you guys were doing the the talk on the weekend. Mm, indeed. So, was will I keep going? Was there anything else you wanted to add about that man? You can do it. Okay. 247, we're talking about the third example of the Roman wife and mother who's denied education by her husband, but she loves her husband and children and has no wish of ill will against them. Uh, she might be angry, but there might be... So there might... But she might be angry underneath it all. She might be angry, but there's... There might be unexplained patterns of behaviour and symptoms, moments of acknowledgement, um, and uh, we would have to look. For, this is on 248 now. We've gone up to the top of 248. So I've written uh, we would look for patterns of spiteful ill-wishing um, because all of these things could take many forms. But um, ultimately we're, we're meant to believe that she's not angry about it aren't we? We're meant to think that she's accepted it. 
And, and this is another, um, I'm sure Nussbaum would be thinking of this case. This is exactly the case um, that Seneca writes about his own mother, who uh, was told by Seneca's father that she shouldn't study philosophy. Uh, and that obviously had been some kind of issue in the family because Seneca pointedly refers to it and, and says, I think it's in the Consolation of Helvia to his mother, one of the Consolations anyway, he says, I wish my father had had better judgment or something in, in, because he forbade you from learning philosophy. So I'm sure Nussbaum would be thinking of that very case. <laughs> yeah. And reflecting on her own potential situation. She was lucky that she was given that opportunity and obviously had to struggle to get into the position. And But she probably recognises her own privilege as well, that she's been very fortunate. Um, but, you know, here we see just the regular old-fashioned mother that you find um, behind a lot of a, a client's um, neurosis in therapy because, I mean, it even came up today in, I was in a prison and they were talking, one woman in particular was going, just going on about her mother and how crippling the kind of anxiety of, of having to deal with her mother is. So, you know, here we see a woman who says she loves her family and I've sacrificed so much for you, you ungrateful little thing, <laughs> you know, like, oh, my God. Um, is that aggression? That's the question. And, again, of course, you know, I always feel like, you know, um, Nussbaum's very interested in this subtle, unconscious kind of aggression as opposed to always the, the kind of stuff that's um, consciously intentional and so on. Mm, yeah, exactly. That's the, yeah, because it, as, as she says here, it can take many forms. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, we're, but it's meant to be a counterexample. Uh, so anyway, um, a dubious one. So number four is a parent becoming angry at a child who misbehaves. So towards the bottom of 248. Um, but she loves the child and she wishes it well. So she might wish to inflict corrective punishment, as we talked about before, just something that is not is mild, not severe. And she only feels irritated. Um, but if it were serious anger, the parent may wish uh, something bad to happen to the child. Um, and so here she brings Nikidian back in and says that Nikidian sees the wish of anger by itself is aggressive, that the, the, the wish of anger is aggressive. Uh, the fear, a fear is the appropriate response in the child. Um, so, you know, and, and it would be, so the child would sense danger in the, in the domestic life, or we're meant to see that danger is possible in the domestic life. And even that use of that sort of language, the wish, the wishing, that's so familiar to psychoanalysis, you know, the the infantile wish fulfillment, you know, of dreams, for example. There's always this idea that the the kind of uh, aggressive urges motivate this unconscious wish to destroy or or, or harm the object who's getting in your way, even if it's your mother. And luckily in the Freudian case, it's it's blocked from consciousness because it's a taboo and so on and so forth. But here um, there is a distinction. She says, and I noticed this, that he never says, Epicurus and Lucretius never say that there's some sort of innate drive in man. It's not like it's a... A, um, you know like something to do with his psychic in, endowment it's it's just a condition of his being in the world in this vulnerable situation so it's it's more of his about his context and environment and his awareness of his vulnerability than the fact that he's somehow evil or bad or corrupt or something like that you know which is interesting mm. okay I'll um, push, push on here. The, um, okay, so uh, Nikidian then as a sort of a, uh, so we're moving on now from those examples. We're still on 249. So Nikidian would feel convinced that 
ira and our ira is that the greek word for um uh, anger is it it's latin, latin word for latin, anger. sorry <laughs> latin for anger is a problem in personal relations and society so for example the roman civil war is given as an example um one remedy for the damages of anger, according to Epicurus, is complete self-containment and self-sufficiency. The wise man will avoid being in a condition of weakness or need towards his fellow humans. He will avoid both anger and gratitude. So we've moved on to top of 250 now. Um, but, yeah, so that idea now comes in from Epicurus of that, ideal of self-containment and self-sufficiency um, and he will avoid both anger and gratitude um, and 250 at the top of 250 so in philodemus we see a similar um, idea wise what the wise man may feel brief or light anger uh, he will view an offense as a rem as a remediable defect in the offender and punishment as necessary for correction or improvement. So that was the idea from Philodemus. Um, the Epicurean proposal of cutting ties with the external world seems to get rid of too much, says Nussbaum. It seems to get rid of protectiveness and loyalty, yet Epicurus sees um, friendship as an end in itself, uh, seeing affiliation and love as important. Um, so Lucretius confronts it by a therapy of anger that is communal and familial, not solitary, fostering interdependence and mutual need. And that takes us to the end of... It seems to be the case, right, this is my understanding, that the Epicurean therapy that she's sort of talking about is, in her mind, sort of impoverished because of that, right? And the Lucretian one seems more moderate because it's talking about friendship and, 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 and kind of communal goods. I mean, is that right? Is that how you understand that? Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's an accurate characterization. Um, and that could be in part, and I can't remember if she actually mentions this, but it could be in part that Lucretius is coming from a Roman background, which uh, tended to, in general, I would say, allocate women and the women uh, as members of families more of an important role than than in classical Athenian society. So I would say that that might be part of it. I'm happy to go on to section three if... if go for happy. it. Beautiful. Okay, so section three opens with a quote from the Curia Doxa. That's the, the key sayings uh, of Epicurus. The blessed and immortal has no troubles itself and causes no trouble to any other, so that it is, it is constrained neither by anger nor by gratitude, for all this sort of thing resides in weakness. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? Hallelujah, baby. <laughs> <And> this, was, <laughs> this was apparently uh, among the sayings that pupils had to memorise and repeat as their tetrapharmicon, their fourfold drug connecting the strength of self-sufficiency with the absence of anger and also with this idea of how the gods were, which is a completely countercultural kind of idea. And so I guess it did need these kind of reinforcements. Uh, so for the, for the Epicureans, the gods are complete. They have what it is to be divine, to be without limit or need, and they've got no interest in our world and they have no needs from it. So nothing that they can do is an, can be an occasion for our rage. So Lucretius, uh, Northbaum says, takes this characterization and develops it, uh, inviting the reader to reflect about this the god's freedom. Uh, on the other hand, he has also invoked Venus, and of course, Venus was the ancestral goddess of Rome. Uh, 
and yeah, he uh, he echoes this idea that the gods are neither constrained by gratitude nor touched by anger. Uh, and this was a contrast between the parlous state of the Roman Republic at the time. So the gods are said to live a placid and serene life, very tranquil. Um, they have very great power, but they're inactive. Now we kind of, <laughs> it's almost hard for us to, to even understand what that could look like. How, how would we how would we understand the power of the gods when they never actually do anything? <laughs> so maybe there's a bit of a, a difficulty in, in making that very clear. Um, but that's what Lucretius does. He says he tries to get a, across the idea that um, despite their uh, that their uh, their reluctance to get involved with anything, their um, uh, they're not secure on account of being tough. They're very light and delicate. So they're a different, different um, arrangement of the basic atomic structure. Uh, and so they're not living in the same exposed situation as humans are. They're residing well away in the intermundia, space between the worlds, because on the Epicurean cos cosmic view, uh, there were just atoms and void. That's what there were. There were different configurations of atoms and void. And this intermundia, uh, and it just makes me think of uh, the Epicurean philosophy more and more like a, a spacecraft cult, you know, with, and, and it's just like L. Ron Hubbard's uh, Scientology or something like that. It's pretty cool. No, and it's also... It is, but it's also, um, you know, people. A lot of people today consider that, and probably the majority of people, I don't know, would consider that uh, what what is apparent in the cosmos is, in fact, a result of random interactions be, um, between uh, not atoms exactly, but but um, material of various kinds, random over an incredibly long time. So, yeah, I don't know that Epicurean and cosmic cosmology has been superseded. <laughs> um, but, uh, but whether or not the gods, like, this is the, the kind of bit which comes up next, too, is it's like, uh, are we talking about sort of the gods of the quantum world, you know, or are we talking about um, kind of intelligent beings of a type that, uh, I mean, which is, you know, obviously... Stoics have some interesting ideas about an intelligent cosmos, but but I don't know. I can't help but maybe I'm being way too judgmental. But I'm thinking of aliens all the time when I when I read this sort of stuff. <laughs> but I, I'm sure I'm just being really judgmental. Um, what do you guys think about that? Not aliens. Well, th there's the other view given um, on two fifty three that. Or is it just mental constructs? You know, there is that other giant, giant, beautiful aliens or imaginary kind of um, human constructs. <laughs> the aliens, because they they're aloof, like aliens are. <laughs> well, apparently, aliens are very interested in this guy. <laughs> On some views, aliens. <laughs> Are just desperate to get to know us. <laughs> There's nothing in the cosmos. Not if you're Epicurean. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting. Um, I hadn't actually um, clocked until I read this that Long and Sedley have interpreted um, the Epicurean gods in this way. Uh, that they're that they're really kind of mental constructs. That's that's a bit counterintuitive to me because I, I well I have just recently <laughs> in drafting that essay you got in your email Jody I have recently looked at the uh, Diogenes Laertius um, book on the Epicureans again and it's pretty clear that I mean they uh, yeah I, I, I mean I, I wouldn't question long and sadly but but um, yeah they they do seem to be talking about gods uh, and and that's where your your intuition there Courtney about the aliens is right I mean. Um, I think they kind of do function a bit the way aliens do in in some aspects of our culture. <laughs> They're kind of like these cosmic observers, 
but set, but at, at a remove, if you like. Is and as work... she acknowledges, Lucretius does not settle these issues. Is the word simulacra? Can you? I haven't looked it up. I should have looked it up. Is simulacra? Does that just mean like an imaginary? An imaginary uh, uh, no, it's yeah, a, a simulacrum. The singular is simulacrum. The plural is simulacra. It's a copy. A so, copy. Um, yeah. So, so when they talk about simulacra, is it that we can't perceive the gods directly? Um, so there's a simulacra. Is in you know I mean how is the simulacra important to to this representation of the gods because it, it often comes up, it well, but I think it does have a technical meaning here in, in Lucretius as as the appearance of of the that we get. Well, he, well, Did he does say... want us to believe they're substantial, doesn't he? He wants us to believe. It says that he. That's what he but is trying to get. Did us you to say believe. the appearance of the gods? You you broke up a bit. Oh yeah, so um, simulacrum has a number of sense, uh, senses, I guess, and and the basic one is a copy, an imitation. But I think technically, and I'm I'm not 100 percent sure about this, and Carl may be able to confirm. But I think technically in Lucretius, um, he he uh, he uses it like a, a sense impression. Is is that is that right, Carl? Do, do you remember? Um, I don't I don't know about Lucretius. But they're special oh, atoms. Oh. They're not perceived yeah, right. by the senses. They're perceived by the mind. And so Simply we can... kind of emanations yeah, emanating can, out of things. We can dream of them, for example. The, the dreams are made up of a kind of uh, atomic substance as well. And so we can conceive of the bodies of the gods and things like that in dreams. I, I think that comes into this idea of simulacra, right? Maybe that the gods are projecting mm. them, for example, down to us. It's a bit hard to separate it from uh, from continental uh, philosophy, like uh, what Baudrillard. In in my mind, uh, I, when I hear that, I sort of I sort of go there. Not that I could bring up what it means to them either. But... <laughs> well, leave, leave that one with me. I'll confirm about whether it's whether it's got this technical meaning in Lucretius. I think I think it does, but I'll double check. I've, I've noticed uh, Seneca uses it a bit. Uh, simulacra, simulacra, simulacrum. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to go back into that, but. Um, yeah, I was looking. I was looking at that at one point. Okay, so where are we um, now? Uh, yeah, Lucretius doesn't really settle the issues, but and but she uses she goes to Cicero for a bit of confirmation. His uh, Cicero's character in De Natura Deorum on the nature of the gods, um, his his Epicurean interlocutor. Uh, seems to want to believe in the real existence of the gods with these characteristics. So I think we have to take it at face value. On the other hand, she points out, and this is going over the next page, the function of the gods in the poem is to exemplify this tranquility. Uh, and, and the issue about the long and settling view doesn't really affect the point at issue. But so what uh, Lucretius does spend a lot of time on in book five is painting the contrast with uh, the world as we encounter it as humans. And uh, he paints a fairly grim picture of how uh, hostile it can be for defenceless humans. Uh, many places are inhospitable, climates are difficult, there are hostile wild beasts. Um, and this is interesting, the earth itself is ageing, losing the vital energy that is the source of our sustenance. Even the animals can live better lives than we do as they are better protected and have uh, more uh, have less need of defence or covering. And there's an evocative passage about the human infant and how helpless it is, uh, particularly compared to the animals. 
They totally are. Yeah. If you ever drop one, <laughs> don't don't drop one on the hard concrete. They are, and that they they're helpless for a long time, as we can all testify. Um, so at the top of <laughs> the next page, which is um, page two fifty five, in other words, this world is a world in which beasts are at home and live more or less in a godlike situation with nature supplying everything they need. The invulnerability of the gods is delicate and soft. The beast's invulnerability is their toughness. Um, and so just in passing, we can contrast this worldview of how hostile the, uh, the world is to humans with the stoic one, which kind of tends to emphasise how, <laughs> emphasise the good aspects of the world as we encounter it and the protection afforded by families. You know, we've got to remember that for the Epicureans, there were no natural, um, no natural relationships, although, as we're going to see, Lucretia softens that rather with a Roman kind of point of view. And that's the, uh, really, so, that, that's the interesting part too, just to go along with that. That's the difference that comes out of a providential cosmos, right? Because in one that's atomic and, and just random, um, there's no reason why um, we would be safe, really. Um, but in the stoic one, everything's made according to a kind of plan. And so we've been given every safety and every protection to thrive and be and 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 to make use of what's been given us to to flourish. Yeah, basically. It's very interesting. I love how that uh small difference really accounts for a world of insecurity and vulnerability, or a world in which you can actually become um completely at one with and at ease with the world hopefully um and of course then it's no wonder why the epicurean kind of model has this tension that she keeps referring to because yeah it's like well you've got no providence yet you're talking about trying to become like these immortal godlike creatures who don't really seem to have much in common with us anyway so that's interesting that's right yeah Okay, so uh, again, the, the contrast with the beasts, the animals, uh, and she summarised by saying, Epic Epicurus and Lucretius thus continue an ancient tradition according to which the human being is situated in nature between the beasts and the gods. And Lucretius follows this tradition in showing too that the beasts and the gods have a certain surprising resemblance to one another. Both are in their own way self-sufficient. Neither needs the social or political virtues. And as, yeah, you just said, Courtney, Epicurus's gods being more radically self-sufficient than the gods of myth, well, they're completely different from the gods of myth, um, appear to be even more radically asocial. They have no responsiveness. They have no compassion for our suffering. Uh, so as she, she concludes, and just this passage going over the page, the characterization of the god's life is almost entirely negative. And, uh, and there's a bit of uh, confusion or uncertainty about how, uh, how Lucretius thinks humans in general think about the gods. Uh, Lucretius reports that humans endowed them, that's um, in their concept of them, Tribu of Aeband, attributed them with sense perceptions since they seem to move to speak. But we're not quite sure of how far he endorses this kind of view. And, and modern views of these Epicurean gods have gotten really silly. They even believe they can abduct you and probe your insides with, with medical instruments. That's right. That seems to be a recurring theme. <laughs> Why on yeah. earth would they want to do that? I wonder what you are. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, she reinforces this view by quoting again from Cicero in... Um, De Natura Deorum, Cotta is the uh, Epicurean spokesman and he says, God does nothing, is involved in no ties or occupation, plans no projects, takes delight in his own wisdom and virtue. Well, that's again a bit hard to understand, isn't it? Because wisdom and virtue are human characteristics, um, or at least potentially they are. We can't understand virtue without understanding a context in which virtue could be exerted or or attained or pursued, whereas the gods, by definition, 
in this view, have no reason to pursue virtue. Um, maybe they, by definition, also embody wisdom, but how would they manifest that? So, yeah, that, it all seems rather hard to understand. Yeah, that's a great point, because I think in the last chapter, right, she talked about the problem of even the language of trying to conceive of beings that don't live in the world that aren't afflicted with, you know, a, a world that's constantly changing and uh, and and not having that language of tempor temporality. Um, we wouldn't be able to imagine what such an existence would, would be like, so we wouldn't be able to talk about it. Um, and... So what would virtue mean from such a point of view? Yeah. Well, that's right. And, and as we've actually noted already in some earlier chapters, some of the aspects of Epicurean culture maybe get picked up later in Christian um, theology. And I think maybe one of the, and sort of it sounds counterintuitive, but go with me, um, this ineffability, this, this inability we have to speak about the divine because we, because of our limited nature, we can't conceive of it. Um, that is something I think that was carried over into uh, the Christian worldview. Now, whether there was any input from Epicureanism in that or, or, or not, but I think uh, they maybe converge at that point that we haven't even got the language to speak about the divine because we have so little understanding of it which again was very countercultural from, from the Greek gods' traditional perspective because they were always being talked about in their traditional forms <laughs> because they were quasi-human in so many ways. Um, so, so how do you finally... Oh, so, so, oh, yeah, just because it says where, um, 256 that in Philodemus, in the Dedes, the gods eat, drink and have other activities. Um, that's at the top of page. Yeah, that's right. I, I, sorry, I skipped over that, but you, you're right, Jodie. And, yeah. um, and <laughs> so even among the Epicureans, they perhaps weren't 100% um, yeah. all on the same page about it. And the, and the fact that they are uh, the Epicurus and Lucretius, the gods that complete and not seeking anything, right? So therefore, they don't even need philosophy because philosophy is the art that secures a happy life. Well, they don't need to do that. So they wouldn't even have that. Like you say, no wisdom. There's, they've got no reason. <laughs> yep, and that's right. And that's exactly the converse of, of Aristotle's idea, which Aristotle uh, portrayed the 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 absolutely best possible life and the quasi divine one as this life of contemplation, this this thinking life. <laughs> Whereas, yeah, the Epicurean gods have got no need for that. <laughs> so, as she concludes at the end of the page, in short, the gods are models, but in a negative way. There's a lot of lack. Uh, they lack our problems, but they lack our uh, therapy of philosophy and morality. Um, so she comes back to this idea of humans being um, defenceless in the world. Uh, and so he, uh, Lucretius, and I'm sort of skipping towards the end of the page, sketches two responses available to the human condition counter-aggression against the, um, the hostility of the world and society. Uh, these stratagems are two-edged. They provide some security, but they also increase um, psychological insecurity and nourish, and thus nourish future aggression. Um, so to, but to clarify, and again, this is where she's sketching some of these tensions. So I'm over on 258 now. The human, the human being is not by nature a ferocious or aggressive being. The human child is shown as weak, needy, and rather sad, but it is not hostile. Lucretius does not try here or elsewhere to explain aggression as the outgrowth of an instinctive desire. And this is consistent with what we know about Epicurus. Um, but the there's a... Uh, Aggression doesn't require any particular bad social formation in order to arise. All that's required, and this is your point from earlier, Courtney, is that uh, the human conceives of its own life as a thing of value. It's a perception uh, that gives rise to these um, tempestuous kind of emotions and reactions. 
and such a view can only come up if we realize we're vulnerable, right? Like the gods That's aren't right. concerned with their vulnerability and neither yeah. are the beasts because they're naturally armed and, and they don't need clothes to stay warm and things like that. And you can drop a cat from a large height and it, unlike a baby, it will recover. Yes, don't try this at home. But I was going to um, say, so, you know, your idea about the 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 Christian connection there. I was just thinking about that. I'm a bit slower at thinking than you guys are, but I was thinking, especially the way that she she talks about the the negative uh, characteristics that God is presented in um, in this Epicurean version. Um, when you get these kind of negative uh, explanations or characteristics or whatever you have you put it uh, of god they, they tend to appear in maimonides how do, how do you say his name my maimonides maimonides mm -hmm. the neoplatonists and this sort of tradition that that definitely has this strong um kind of connection to the the mystical stuff in early christian religion where god is seen as things like the head without a head or the point that's not a point or the limitless light. So these kind of things that, you know, maybe there's a real connection there. They're, they're these kind of descriptions that are negative descriptions as opposed to saying God is omnipotent, God is all-powerful, or oh, well, that's the same thing. You know what I mean? Instead, it's describing God without assigning him any attributes, taking those attributes away. So, yeah, I think maybe you're onto something there. It's an interesting observation. Yeah, no, that's a good point, um, Courtney, about this the negative. Um, and in a sense, the, yeah, the, those uh, negative characterizations arise naturally from um, thinking that, well, God, God, God is in no particular place, God has no particular extension, or, or, and God is um, atemporal. Yeah, you know, so all those negatives, yeah, naturally kind of arise from the um, particular way in which, yeah, the, the divine is characterised. And, I, yeah, I think you're right. I think there's definitely a, a Neoplatonist Yeah, because you, you've got this challenge to present in temporal language a being that, you know, you want to put forward for descriptive purposes that you can't really do because we're speaking in temporal way using a flow of language. And so you have to use these almost, yeah, get close to the edge of things by speaking about some object, but using these negative non-object kind of, are they adjectives? Whatever they are, descriptors, you know, like, like, yeah. But, and it's, it gets very creative then, doesn't it? And probably, <laughs> That's right. It's, it's very interesting. Well, all, all the mystics, but, all the mystics are renowned for it by by negation, you know, seeking God by negation, and the Hindus especially, and they, you know, they've got their, their, you know, neti neti is their saying, which is um, not this, not this, like so, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, it's not that. So they're narrowing, you know, they're getting closer and closer <laughs> by saying what what it is not. <laughs> so yeah, it's the same same exact path of, of mysticism as the neoplatonists in many ways yeah and i guess the point being here in this tradition that uh that it developed out of something from somewhere and yeah it's an interesting connection i wonder you got another puzzle to figure out Jules. <laughs> <laughs> so just to finish off um section three because we're, we're nearly there um There's a striking difference between the two responses that Lucretius has sketched. So there's the, uh, the counter-aggression response and the social response. And um, the social responses are unavailable to both beasts and gods, for there is no mutual dependence, no tenderness, and no compassion. Uh, so she ends with some rhetorical questions. The, the possibility is held out that by gentle interdependence, Human beings can live safely without rage, calling on one another rather than on arms, 
becoming not beast-like but more communally human? Is this a genuine possibility? What does it depend on? And far does it, how far does it solve our problems? Isn't communal anger also a possibility and perhaps a more dangerous one? We can begin answering only when we have studied some case studies, some more case studies of human aggression and ferocity, understanding their psychological structure. I like right, the, who's going to do I like, I like the bit here where it says, you know, we, um, nurseries of future warriors, you know, so that nursing, the nurse, the analogy to, to, to an, be, you know, the nature of a nurse. Um, but the nurse is basically bringing up future warriors. <laughs> All right, I, I can rip into four. I've got fairly short notes on four. Can okay, I just, four. Say, can, can I just yeah. quickly say about four that I saw four as basically a summary of um, her chapters on love and then the chapter on fear of death. Like she's just bringing those ideas again back to... Um, tying it into anger and aggression, isn't she? Sort of thing. Anyway, yeah. sorry, go on. Which I thought was really important. It's, mm. it's good. Mm. It, it links it all back together. Yeah. So she says, I have said that anger and aggression are seen by Epicureans to be closely related to other passions. And as you said, bringing in the other ones, both passionate love in book four and the fear of death in book three, which I shall here treat together with book five's account of religious fear and dependence, she says, reveal a common pattern in our most violent desires and actions, tracing the origins of aggression to a fear for the safety of one's own bodily boundaries, combined with a set of beliefs, mostly false and sometimes very elaborate, about what has damaged those boundaries and what will suffice to protect them. Lovers inflict pain on one, one another. They do so because they perceive their desire for the other person as a source of pain, a wound or ulcerous sore in, in the self. Interestingly, if you remember reading the chapter on Seneca's Medea, she, she uses a very similar language to this about being open to the world and being penetrated by the world and the infection that comes. Okay. Their condition of neediness is experienced as an open hole, a lack of self-sufficiency accompanied by weakness. Uh, in sexual intimacy, they seek to heal these wounds, or as Lucretius also puts it, to extinguish the fire that burns them, thus achieving a condition of self-sufficiency. So Lucretius shows that the lover's aims are based upon false beliefs about what will restore one's mastery and self-sufficiency. And he, and he suggests that a pure pleasure is available that avoids those false beliefs. So Lucretius lets us see possibilities then for the avoidance of erotic aggression. But by linking this aggression to deep-rooted anxiety, also he also mm -hmm. shows his interlocutor that avoidance will not be easy. Similar problems arise. Book three shows in human beings relation to their own death. But once again, the experience of their own incompleteness and vulnerability leads them to create elaborate stratagems of self-protection that are believed to shore up these boundaries against assault. So these stratagems are never successful since death and finitude are never defeated dramatically demonstrated by Voldemort, who, despite splitting his soul into multiple parts and hiding in them in horcruxes, fails anyway. So this attempt to secure the bounds of the self, like erotic love, involves increasing aggression against others. This opens up in turn new types of vulnerability and sources of anger. One major stratagem is turning to religion, which Lucretius connects with aggressive behavior. He carefully shows how images of angry, punishing divinities created initially as support for human incompleteness, both increase fearfulness and, and dependence, and also engender possibly by imitation ferocious acts such as the slaughter of Iphigenia, in which priestly commands prevail over paternal love and compassion. Religion promises to turn the needy, incomplete being into a being as secure as the gods are seen to be, as secure as the gods are seen to be. It does not work. And that 
and its consequences, in fact, or its consequence is, in fact, an increase in weakness, a hidden force that saps human strength, engendering self-contempt and acquiescence in the frequently aggressive projects of the priests. There's like 10 commas in that sentence. Not quite, but nearly. Two other devices for warding off death are prominently identified in the poem, the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of power and honor. Again, these stratagems lead to competition and aggression with others. Even the mere fact of another's, possess of another's possession of those things is viewed as a damage since it keeps from the wealth seeker what he thinks he needs to save himself. So in all these cases, an initial sense of incompleteness leads to attempts to secure oneself against threats and wounds. But such attempts involve competition and thus easily lead to angry, aggressive behavior towards others who are threats on account of their very presence. Furthermore, since the fortification saw is never sufficient to yield the protection that is really desired, the agent forms even more exaggerated and unlimited desires for the goods in question, desires that are colored already by envious resentment against others who possess some of what is desired. These desires lead directly to the desire to hurt, kill, rob, humiliate those who are seen as obstacles to the fulfillment of an essentially impossible project. War is presented as the more or less inevitable outcome of the fear of death and as closely bound up with the other ambitions that grow out of that fear. It increases itself without limit, beginning with the simplest weapons, hands, nails, teeth and stones, and branches broken off in the forest, and proceeding on through bronze and iron weapons to the complex horrors of modern warfare. That made me think, you know, that's the end, by the way, of that section, but it made me think of, and it's very plausible that, given this perception of vulnerability and this capacity to think that if we can get more and uh, and strive for power and domination over others, that we would feel safer. But on the other hand, that leads to more competition and more aggressiveness. And then because of the kind of beings that we are, we're able then to produce technologies which increase the strength of our weaponry and stuff like that. And we end up with starting out with stones and branches and then iron weapons and then suddenly we've got nuclear weapons and now we have the capacity to be able to completely erase each other from the world so in a way we can kind of see an evolution of of aggression uh, aggressive desires aggression and and it's, i think it's really prescient in that sense because you can see how technology would be used in that sort of a way and also that as the threat grows greater and and the kind of promise of doom is more impending, also our kind of desire and 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 kind of reaching out for a peaceful resolution should become because we become more and more acutely aware of how how fraught human existence is and, and what a kind of innate failure our kind of abilities to kind of compute our vulnerability and the situation it places us in. That's that's Kind of interesting. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, it was uh, she really make reference to the Smurfs? Uh, the Smurfs. To the Smurfs. Yeah, the Smurfs. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> I must have mumbled. She didn't mention the Smurfs. About Voldemort or. Oh, Voldemort. Oh, Voldemort's from Harry Potter. Oh, really? <laughs> Oops. But Courtney, you're right. I mean, it's the concept of the arms race, what, isn't it? And and, uh, and I guess the arms race has been going on ever since, <laughs> you know, the beginning of technology. And certainly um, the Romans were, were very interested in military engineering. And um, so, yeah, it's... It's an arms race, and and yeah, you're right. We've now, well, in the middle of the 20th century, we've got to the point of um, mutually assured destruction. Mm. Are we going to talk about that? I mean, it's not not likely to kill everyone, is it? 
No, probably not. <laughs> but whether it does or doesn't. Even the worst nuclear scenario is not going to kill everyone. But um, but I don't think that's Nussbaum's point. Like the point is um, no. she's she's sort of saying, um, you know, this stuff comes out. The progression out... Of, of, the, of that um, desire to dominate each other. Yeah, yeah, she's giving us completely destroying each other. A psychological account based on human vulnerability and and the vicious circle it kind of leads to. Yeah, that's for sure. Hmm. Who would like to do? Oh, unless you got more to say about that, the, the next section five. Yeah, I'm happy to do five. It's fairly short. Um, where and the last line um, I wrote down for 264 was um, where does the line get drawn between self-defense and atrocity I thought that was a good point you know yeah anyway I'll go and I'll get five belted out and then we can talk about it so um, in five we're on 264 um, Lucretius's account in book five is of the origins of civilization and he gives a, an ethical analysis so he's giving the sequence of the forms of life um, and he, he claims that in the beginning there were much harder, tougher humans that re were resembling beasts, um, um, you know, and beasts which act with heedless aggression. Um, so the human race began then to grow soft when it settled and uh, started to settle in dwellings and use clothing and fire um, uh, and the resulting indoor family life that resulted and marriage relationships. Just before you get too into yeah. it, yeah. I, just, I just want to say I think that's really interesting that she points out very clearly that, you know, she says, like so many accounts in ancient literature, its primary function is less literal reconstruction than ethical analysis. Because often people will read this sort of stuff, the golden age of the Greeks and things like that, and go, well, clearly that's not accurate, is it? But, you know, funnily, she's not, this account, although mythological and, and, and importantly playing an ethical role, it's talking about, um, you know, um, sort of, kind of uh, what it's like to be in the world and the kind of ethical characteristics of it, that, that kind of idea. Importantly, um, oh, God, my mind's gone blank. Um, nah, it's gone. I wanted to say something about that. I have to come back to it. Can anyone well, just, read my mind? Well, just break in. As soon as it comes, just say, hey, I remembered it, okay? Um, yeah, because... So, so that idea that these early, tough, hard humans, um, you know, in their uh, trial to survive, did act with bestial types of, uh, you know, heedless aggression, but it wasn't through wanting to inflict punishment or anything. So oh, then the I human remembered. race... I remember. Good. good. So although it's an ethical account and an ethical analysis, when you read it, it's still plausible. It comes across as not so dissimilar in, in, in some respects to what an evolutionary kind of account of, of, uh, of human life would often look like. Uh, I only mention it because I think it's really important to remember that, it, that it's got an ethical flavor. Um, but even though we might, some people might kind of laugh at these ancient accounts, they do more than just what evolutionary accounts do. They don't just account for um, physiological change. They also say something about what it means to be a human being. It amazes yeah. me that their, that their history reached into these ideas because we've come to them through archaeology and unearthing evidence, you know, physical evidence. And so it's like they've got this lineage of history that they've been able to carry through with their um, verbal stories and whatnot before even writing emerged, you know, that gives you a sense of continuity in their... Yeah. In their but in their but as, as Courtney says, there's also this um, moralising aspect, basically, you know, and we see, you know, if, if you spend any time on the, broadly on the right, on the internet, you see versions of this all the time, you know, it's, it's, it's a nostalgia for an imagined 
tough past when men were men <laughs> and were able to, you know. Uh, so it, for whatever the psychological motivation to, to arrive at this kind of account is still observable around today, this, this idea that so with civilization comes somehow weakness. With um, pr prior to civilization, you know, everyone was more capable, everyone was tougher. Uh, and so, yeah, there's that nostalgia there's for this imagined um, past uh, it, it, an imagined past that was somehow morally superior to um, <laughs> to today, and and this was something that the Romans did a lot. You know, it wasn't just wasn't just Lucretius. It was it was a kind of a a golden ageism that that um, you could see in a lot of different forms. You can see it in Seneca as well. You know, he talks about um, when worship was simple and people just had little little clay gods and nobody bothered about golden temples and everything, you know, this idea of this this imagined simple and <laughs> simple, strong and rugged past that that um, was somehow superior. So yeah, inter very interesting psychologically and and um, and kind of emotionally, I guess. Okay, so I'll I'll keep going. So so two sixty five. Um, we're at the top of 265. So that's when he talk, uh, she talks about um, the human race becoming uh, softer with settled dwellings, clothing, fire, indoor family life, marriage, community, compassion, um, and which is referring here somewhat to an Epicurean view of contract the contractual nature of justice emerging. But also on this page, Courtney, is the thing about the, the reference to the sown men of Greek legend that you brought up on the Facebook page, that discussion you put on of all the sources uh, to the sown men of Greek legend. They were born as in adult form as warriors from the earth directly. They had no babyhood or childhood. They just sprung forth with their full weaponry and um, killed yeah, each I, other. I had they not, killed each other. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know about that. Which... No, I didn't. And it was kind of interesting that there were so many sources talking about it. And weirdly, it's a reference that comes up in The Strangest Places too, because I, I can remember a, a book on medieval magic, presumably written, you know, in the late medieval period. It was called The Book of Abramel and the Mage. And it talks about magical practices where you could um, cause hundreds of armed men to sprout from the ground, you know? So, like interesting that the same like stories would come up in you know in late medieval wizardry magic you know it's quite really interesting how these things just get recycled over and over again i can remember as a kid watching jason and the argonauts that movie that first movie and and those warriors that were came up out of the ground that was in that movie i remember that as a child going oh <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, all right. So anyway, so yes, the Epicurean view of the contractual nature of justice is emerging here. Um, so uh, 267, this is all seen as one stage of development. So, so the softening is seen as a weakening out of which the angry passions arise uh, and our more complex and dangerous attitudes. Um, aggression arises over, now she lists here, Garments, houses, family relationships, sexual monogamy. Um, so there are the, so it it it, it brings out the necessary conditions of war, basically war, murder, sexual sadism, and and uh, are all those. The, she sees these as sort of the origins of these things are set in place. Um, when it was supposed to be the solution for those problems, you know, it's like these things are recurring. Yeah. But also, we're still on 267, but also humans are capable of concern, of love, stable moral dispositions, mutual pleasure and marriage. Um, so there's this combination of vulnerability with, with awareness. And uh, then she says, language and philosophy develop as well as the false arts of love and religion. So um, those bad forms of love and religion that, that are new sources of rage, she says. Now we're on the top of page 268. 
So rage is then moderated in all of this big ongoing process. So then rage is moderated by laws and institutions, um, but then this results in envious resentment and competitive struggle for power and position. Um, and then therefore the further development of weapons, um, increased anxiety for the self and for those that are close to us. Um, the bad form of love and false religion come from our sense of weakness and vulnerability. That's a really good summary sentence, isn't it? The bad form of love and false religion come from our sense of weakness and vulnerability. Our individual care for our own life and bodily integrity, our freedom from pain causes our search for safety. So, um, our interactions can be peaceful or destructive, basically, is how she finishes that section. Anything oh, thanks, there? Thanks, Shall I dive into six? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so uh, Lucretius uh, is going to analyse um, the passions of the individual soul and uh, along the way, in book five, he has a digression in, ex in account, uh, giving an account of the exploits of Hercules against the monsters um, of the world. But the hero's exploits have not dealt with the most dangerous monsters, which are the soul's desires, especially fear and sexual longing. Uh, if the heart, pectus, is not purged, what battles and dangers must we not endure against our will? So the human soul is the site of uh, internal battle. Uh, and at the top of the next page, this was page 270, uh, there's obviously a slippage and instability between the external and the internal. Um, and the violence with which passion attacks the soul is expressed in the poetry as in the word skindunt cuts uh, and she, she she doesn't give us the whole line but she says that the word cuts the line sharply in two the soul's openness to and need from the world calls up in itself violent and destructive moments and so this comes back again to your point Courtney about self-hatred uh, for what these monsters rely on is the belief that no one is sorry that one is no good without external things that one cannot fully control uh, and here, Lucretius links long for immortality uh, and suicidal thoughts. What wonder is if human beings hate and despise themselves? Uh, so then in book six, uh, he goes further into these desires and these um, bad feelings, anxious heart, a quarter, um, uh, and uh, no, this vexed their lives against their will in gratis. So it was something that happened without them wanting to, without any respite and forced them to rage in hostile quarrels. He, that is Epicurus, understood that the defect was in the vessel itself and that because of its deficiency, all the things that come in from without, even good things, are corrupted. This is something, again, that has got, um, seems to prefigure some Christian views, right? This, this um, radical corruption of the human vessel. Uh, although... Uh, the image here of um, the vessel being leaky and full of holes, that actually, I think, comes from Plato. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a scene of aggression and a scene of chaos. Uh, Lucretia shows once again how the soul's war inside itself poisons life and makes it hateful. And then we come back to this section on warfare and weapon making and this rather strange uh, narrative about the use of uh, wild beasts in war. Um, just, just sidebar, of course, one of the things that we find most horrendous about Roman culture was the fact that thousands upon thousands of, of animals were collected and just sent to slaughter in the in the arenas. So this was something that Lucre uh, Lucretius probably would have witnessed, um, the kind of the responses and reactions of these poor animals in a state of um, stress. Uh, 
And uh, so on the next page, she notes, <laughs> and I love how Nilsbaum sort of slides back and forth into, you know, she has her, her very scholarly moments, and this is one of them. The fantastic nature of this passage has caused great consternation among Lucretia's commentators. Um, and so she cites Bailey uh, and what Bailey thought, but then concludes, I, under, I suggest that we best understand the complexity of Lucretia's design if we read it in the same double manner in, in which we have been forced by the ambiguity of the text to read the passages from the two proems. The story of horror is a story not just about what human beings do to one another in war, but also, and more importantly, a story of the self-destructive violence of the soul against itself, as, as you pointed out early on, Courtney. And as she um, gives some examples that support this reading. Uh, linking these, these wild animals with the monsters of the soul. Uh, and at the top of the next page, uh, page 273, uh, she cites Lucretius' strange phrase, warmed by mingled blood, per mixta caide calentes. Uh, the idea of blood from different organisms uh, mingling with each other in war, but of course it has a, a, a resonance around um, sexual intercourse as well. So it's a it's an image, but it's also a story of the structure of destructive human wishes, self-lacerations of longing and fear. And to conclude that passage, wholeness, by contrast, can be preserved only by a gentle disposition. All right, I'll hand over to someone else for section seven. Courtney, you might do you want to take it take it home? Sure, sure, sure. Um, just before though, you know that bit about the lions and stuff um, resembling aggressive desires and stuff. Um, I was just curious. My Bible stuff's really bad, but Psalm ninety one is a very famous um, psalm, and there's a line in there right where he says, um, "Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, and all that sort of stuff." Um, interesting. I mean, I don't know if there's any connection, but definitely in some of those um, psalms, the kind of baser aspects of human nature are, are treated as those sort of creatures, lions and serpents and things like that. So obviously, um, yeah, don't know if there's a link, but plausible explanation. Um, okay, number seven. But the monsters of the soul have an enemy, we're told, that enemy is Epicurean philosophy. Yeah. The poem repeatedly compares Epicurus' account with humanity to a war, but a war in which the enemy is aggression itself and in which the weapons are the gentle and even pleasant weapons of words and arguments. He's such a hippie. In his account of Epicurus's achievement, Lucretius offers Memmius and the reader new images of heroism, of war and of victory, to replace the traditional aggressive norms cherished by Roman society. So in the first book, the description of Rome's brief respite from war is followed by the description of another and very different type of warrior, that's Epicurus. Um, he's contrasted, so Epicurus not named, but called a Greek human being, introducing already a contrast between words and arms that is Greek reasoning and Roman might, he dared to oppose religion and to conquer on our behalf an understanding of nature. And he now returns as a Roman military hero conducting a triumph. He's a little bit like John Lennon. I'm going with this whole heavy thing. <laughs> Greece is the source for many of the bad arts of the soul. For the Athenian art of money making and the pursuit of honor for the love poetry that oh sorry and the pursuit of honor for the love poetry that gives the roman soul its bad images desire of desires um for the priestly slaughter of iphigenia um, and perhaps therefore for much of roman religion but it is also from greece 
that philosophy arises. And only from this comes the possibility of peace. It reminds me of that song by John Lennon called God. You know, he goes, do you know the song? It's like, don't believe in the Bible. Dun, 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 dun. Don't believe in tarot. And it goes on and on about all the things he doesn't believe in. And so basically he's critiquing religion and politics and that and at the end. I only believe, you know, I just believe in me. Do, 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 Epicurus in me. <laughs> so we find out that Epicurus is the true hero since he has conquered the really dangerous monsters using only LSD. No, getting silly now. The soul's desires and conquered them with words, not arms. Words, not LSD. Portraying his own relationship with Epicurus as a non-competitive and non-aggressive love. Lucretius also replaces for the reader the love of gold by the love of the golden words of Epicurean philosophy which set to flight the terrors of the mind. Um, so what else? The anxiety that gives rise to strife can be put to flight only by knowledge and self-knowledge. Anxiety is the soul's darkness. I like that line. Philosophy, it's light. Anxiety is the soul's darkness. Philosophy, it's light. Clearly, Lucretius believes that confronting one's desire, desires is a long step in the di direction of making them more healthy. So in a number of specific areas, this idea works to contain aggression. The arguments concerning love, as I argued, as Miss Baum argued, reveal to the lover the futility of his projects and the falseness of the beliefs on which they are based, clearing the way for a more fruitful relationship with one's lover and family. I like that, and it makes a lot of sense, really. Remember in the previous chapter, it was instead of trying to seek a union, an impossible union with the loved object, it's really understanding that that's an impossible project and that we should just learn to see each other as real human beings having real human relationships in the world. Perfectly good. Um, only then could we have a really grounded source of pleasure. The arguments concerning death set a limit in a similar way to the boundless desire for life, convincing the pupil of the futility of attempts to achieve complete deathlessness. In general, the account of the non-teleological character of the world and of our place in it convinces the pupil not to make impossibly high demands that being frustrated will give rise to new rage and new aggression. It also convinces her to interpret the world's damages, not as voluntary assaults from gods or nature, but as simply there, the natural conditions of our life. Thus as occasions for effort and resistance, but not for anger. The triumph of philosophy, in short, is a triumph not through political action, about which the poem is remarkably silent, but within each human soul in relation to itself, as the soul learns to acknowledge its humanness and that of others. Do we want to say anything about that yet, or still going? To be willing to live as a soft body rather than an armed fortress. There's, an, there's a very powerful acceptance in that so during her course of study um, this is Nikidian, the repeated teaching of epicurean physics and ethics would alter alternate one supposes with personal analysis so i obviously thought this was interesting because from a therapeutic point of view so there's an alternation between the teaching of the philosophy and personal analysis so that she would at one and the same time increase the grasp of the arguments over her waking and sleeping life and also bring the arguments into vivid confrontation with her own symptoms and behavior as she carries on her daily life with others. Um, and we're told, and we, as people interested in Stoicism will recognize this, that in much the same way Seneca examines himself at the close of each day, scrutinizing his behavior for the seeds of anger and giving himself criticism from the point of view of Stoic ethics, but in the Epicurean case, one imagines 
that the teacher would continue to play a central role. And of course, if you're interested in that, um, I always go back and read that uh, um, seminar by Foucault on the technologies of the self, because he talks about how that process um, changes over time, so that if you remember the Christians, it becomes a kind of confessional, yeah. So there are tensions in this teaching, Epicureanism, however, as we have seen throughout these chapters. Thank God we're getting to the end of them. There is in Lucretius's Epicureanism a deep attachment to godlike self-sufficiency that pulls against the injunction to live in accordance with nature, accepting the limits of a finite life. Yeah. Um, we have already seen that he appears to treat the condition of the gods as a normative, or as normative for a kind of self-sufficiency that humans humans can also appropriately seek, apparently. And elsewhere as well, he expresses an aspiration towards complete invulnerability. Um, Epicurean philosophy is depicted as a fortress of peace from which one may look down on the suffering of others. In one way, the search for invulnerability and the search for an acceptance of one's limits cohere. For the one who accepts limits is free of many vulnerabilities and anxieties that afflict the ambitious. One who inhabits the fortress built by Doctrina has less need than others to build the fortress of war. And that's very reminiscent of the Stoic perspective as presented by Seneca. And yet one feels as well a tension in these lines, from the Epicurean point of view at least, for it is not clear that the fortified condition is really one that accepts a finite non-godlike life this same tension is present in the poem's attitude towards friendship and justice the gods as we saw lack strong attachment to others neither just nor unjust they simply live on invulnerably and the poem offers nikidian the hope of a godlike life on the other hand as we have also seen the poem invites its reader from its very opening words to develop a broader set of attachments caring deeply about spouse and family and even about the city and country and furthermore, the poem seems to endorse pity or compassion for the needs of other weak humans. And this passion, the Stoics would thoroughly, the Stoics more thoroughly committed to invulnerability, sternly denounce. So thus the poem seems to leave its reader not only with an absence of greedy striving, but also with a good deal of strong positive concern for the well-being of others. And it suggests in its portrayal of family life that such strong bonds are an essential part of the development of the passion for justice. So unlike Stoic accounts, Lucretius therapy does not attempt to derive just conduct from the sense of duty alone, nor does it appear to motivate it entirely out of a concern for one's own safety. It allows it to rest upon love and compassion, where friendship and civic attachment and concern, Lucretius proves more willing to accept the neediness of our mortal condition than in his arguments about death and erotic passion. The finite, finitest side of his argument appears to prevail, at least on balance, over the immortalist side. He gives philosophical therapy in this area, human rather than divine goal, and promises it, where anger is concerned, a human triumph. The poet reminds us that philosophy operates patiently on the soul of individuals. The majority shrink from it, but this means that the philosophy depends to a great extent on chance for the opportunity of engaging in exchange of arguments and forming the bonds of friendship. And isn't that a nice thing? I mean, that's kind of what we talk about and do in this group, and it's beautiful. Philosophy operates patiently on the souls of individuals. The majority shrink from it. Yeah. And it's so hard to introduce people to philosophy. They see it as pointless. But like he says here, it has a lot to do with friendship and community. And that's really lovely. Aren't we led to see then that even a good friendship is always in this case a chancy business for how high is the likelihood that two gentle non-aggressive characters characters whose attachment and passions are only those recommended by epicurean philosophy will meet up in rome or meeting avoid disaster or meet in brisbane oh my god like what's the chance but here we are so the, i guess that's a good point right i mean and that's an interesting fact about the Stoic movement and sort of 
going off on a tangent, but there hasn't been too many aggressive characters in the in the Stoic movement. How many times have you seen someone get kicked out of the agora here? It's it's not common. Or the Stoicule, we've not had to crack any heads against the um, you know, the columns. Um, I'm nearly at the end. One must not think, writes the poet in book three on the subject of anger, that the evils can be rooted up and completely and rem removed completely. The vestigia, however small, remain. Here, Lucretius Epicureanism differs from Stoicism, presumably in keeping with the greater importance it attaches to such worldly goods as the health and integrity of the body, marriage, and friendship. What do you think about that? That's interesting, isn't it? Because we know that um, Nussbaum's chapter on Seneca uses a word like extirpation, which is to tear out by the roots. But Lucretius's version is, is that it can't ever be really completely removed. It's just part of our human condition. Do you have a... What do you think? Of course, Seneca talks about being scarred and, and that that may cause us to feel things, but those things that we feel, if we don't assent to them, will never really be properly passions. Um, well, um, there's a case to be made, and, and we'll obviously talk about this more when we get to the Stoic chapters, but there's a case to be made um, that Nussbaum... Uh, is giving a rather again a rather partial reading of the Stoics here, but yeah, I'll I'll have more to say when we get to that part. <laughs> well, that will be fascinating. There are images of gentleness in the poem. Um, they are typically brief and soon eclipsed by darkness. There is one jumping ahead. There's one sustained example of gentle human social interaction from which one might derive some hope for the soul. This is the poem itself. And this is a really interesting point. It's the poem itself. The therapeutic argument offers to its interlocutor and its readers. I have said, this man has said, that the aggression in the poem is a part of its therapy aimed at motivating the readers and the interlocutor through, through a shock of self-recognition to become involved in philosophy. So, you know, you make the point that... Um, well, no, you didn't really make the point. I'm, I, I kind of imagined that someone would make the point that um, the language was very shocking and violent and all that, and what's the point that it serves? But here it's a confrontation with ourselves to shock us into getting more involved in therapy. So in going along with the poet, we will discover a friendship that is, while at first asymmetrical, becomes increasingly mutual and inspired by hope of a still greater equality, not poisoned by the spirit of competition. It aims to provide pleasure as well as illumination. As poetic language and rigorous argumentation combine in a way unprecedented in the Epicurean tradition, the poem conducts the interlocutor's soul gently from the recognition of his diseases to a clear grasp of truth, showing at every stage in the affectionate concern for his needs and his pleasure. Uh, its composition is always a way of life, extending Lucretius makes clear deep into the soul and shaping even its dreams. Um, and then there's a comment about uh, a recent tendency to see its sudden ending as as bleak and and uh, maybe not complete. Um, and just to finish off, she says, uh, it seems likely in the absence of evidence to the contrary, uh, Lucretius' plan for this conclusion. It is an ending that presents the therapeutic argument as itself without a closure or a happy end. I kind of like that. As subject always to sudden incursions of fear and of anger, the task of therapy is always incomplete. While the roots of these passions remain in the soul, as they do remain in any human life that cherishes itself and knows itself to be incomplete. The way, oh, sorry, the war of philosophy cannot be finished on that page or on the page but only if at all in each reader's daily life i'm talking to you kyle in each day's efforts to build kindly affection affectionate relationships with friends children spouse society in each day's vigilant efforts to limit and manage one's own desires and all this preferably without being torn apart 
or bitten or trampled by the hostility of others. Well, when it comes to erotic love, some of us should be so lucky. Ending the poem on a scene of strife, Lucretius leaves his readers with a solemn warning and turns over to them the dangerous and de delicate job of living well. Very well said, Martha. Very, very good. well said. Very good. And you know what? Remember um, very early in the discussion of one of the earlier Epicurean chapters, she quoted from, um, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Epicurus himself, one of the fragments saying about, um, you know, poetry uh, is like honey smeared around the cup for the for the medicine to take effect. Well, remember, remember the nice poem she started the chapter with? She's doing that, you know, she's enacting the therapy with this, mm. this poem at the start. And um, I'm pretty sure, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure she's doing what she says Lucretius is doing. She's, um, yeah, she's, she's performing a therapy herself, I would say. Yeah, well, thanks. That, that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, that, I've, I've found in this. The, in the book? No, it was in the book. But I found, I've, I've found reading this book to be very therapeutic. I mean, we've all sat with this book for a couple of years, really. It's, it's, it's very, really cool. So, yeah, something good about it. Sorry, Kyle. What were you? Um, yeah, does ther therapy always involve talking? I've been wondering that lately. That's a good question. There's a, well, I mean, going back to what Nussbaum's talking about, it has something to do with Logoi. That was the second or third chapter. She spoke a lot about the way in how in, in the, the, according to these Western schools, that there was a kind of causal effect. I remember the whole stuff about causality, the causal effect of certain Logoi, certain arguments. So, I don't know if that always has to be. Well, it doesn't always have to be because there's a physical medicine of the body, you know, there's tinctures and herbs and medical interventions. But when it comes to the soul, it seems at least from this Hellenistic point of view, there's weight and emphasis on language and argument and teaching. Meditation yeah. comes later in the in the Christian era, doesn't it? Well, the Hesychus um is that is that what it's called the greek orthodox well no i'm just meditation I'm, no i'm just thinking again like Foucault talks about that inward turning and the role of confession of revealing and and uh completely exposing oneself to a master and that kind of builds or creates this notion of an interiority that's not yet there according to Foucault it's not yet there uh, in in these Hellenistic kind of exercises and arguments at least that's my understanding hmm. so it is getting late um any closing statements I just want to say thank you again um I think I really resonate with that idea that it's a philosophy maybe philosophy does depend on that vulnerability and it rises from that and that it in somehow it, it, it involves it deeply involves friendships and that we're lucky if we can find philosophical friendships in the world i think that's a really lovely um, idea and and no wonder i go around trying to um, force people into reading philosophy and then having difficult friendships with people because <laughs> Because they won't meet me on a on a level that in which I can properly love them. So yeah, I don't know what you guys think about that. Well, the the oh, jail I'm... works well. They can't run away from you. <laughs> they cannot get away. Surely, oh, well, I just want to say thank you, everyone. Surely, philosophical friendships are really rivalries, aren't they? I don't know about that. <laughs> it depends on yeah, what so. common common ground you find, Kyle, isn't it? Surely, like if unless you've got, you know, wildly opposing oh, views. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. Well, it'd it, 
it helps anyway. Yeah. It could do. So you any closing around those things. Let's quickly sum up then some closing thoughts. Um, I, I've given mine. Yeah, I thought it was a very complex chapter, but I think we addressed it really well. So thanks to everyone, particularly yeah, Courtney for leading us along and, and Jody and Carl and Shannon. Thanks to everyone. Yeah, I, I found it was inter uh, tied everything back together. This chapter really pulled everything that from the other chapters before it in a way. And so, you know, I saw her treatment of the study of anger and aggression as, as an important, you know, as a really, really important part of, of what the Epicureans were trying very hard to conquer. Hmm. But yeah, it was great. It was good. I didn't have many opinions because I didn't read it, but. It was interesting hearing you guys discuss it. That's why I didn't talk very much. And I'm also tired. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon, Shannon. Well, next time we read it, um, hopefully you'll catch up. Will you be more interested in the skeptic chapter, Shannon? Or you just haven't got time at the moment, have you? Really? Um, it was just the day you got away from me. I was like, yeah, that's... in my, uh, I can, um, I can use my wife as an excuse. I, she was sick. She's pregnant. And I had to make oh, yeah. a dinner and I had to go pick up Thomas. So I sort of lost track of time. And then, yeah, so I, have a, I have a lot of good excuses. Yeah. But yeah, the, I would have liked to have read it. The skeptic one, I think I probably do have like slightly more interest in. But yeah. And oh. I'm, I'm not going to admit as much as that. But um, I remember last time we didn't uh, read the skeptic chapter yeah you're right we missed it, it skipped yeah yeah we missed it there's poor old skeptics so yeah i think it'll be exciting to read actually yeah all right guys wonderful to see you all again have a great week i guess i'll see you on saturday i think okay. yeah absolutely thanks everyone good to yeah. see you all thank you Bye. see you